Hey people, how are you? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Becoming series. Once again, we're exploring the deep truths and the principles that will help you become all you were created to be. How are you doing? How's your day? How's your day going? How are you looking forward to your day to becoming? I hope um, wherever you are in the world, it is going to be, it was, and it is going great, right? Now, um, let's let's just jump into it, okay? So we are talking about, or we were talking about the last time, authenticity as the key to fulfilling the eight greatest needs of the human heart. If you recall, we talked about eight, the eight greatest uh, uh, needs of the human heart. Can you remember what they were? We talked about purpose. We talked about value. We talked about significance. We talked about importance. We talked about meaning. We mentioned fulfillment. We talked about personal power. And we concluded with the need for success. The eight greatest needs of the human heart. And I said that the key to solving the problems or to fulfilling those needs was to manifest yourself, to become yourself. In other words, for you to achieve those needs or for you to answer those needs, quote unquote, you need to become all you were created to be, which essentially is what the show is all about. However, it begs the question of how exactly do we become our true selves? How do we become our authentic self? Now, we, we hear these terms about embrace your authenticity, um, let the world see who you are, uh, shine your light, which is fine, which is fine, which is exactly what we're supposed to do, right? But how do we do that? Now, I think even before we, um, we, 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 we take on those banners because they're like headlines, right? Before we take on those headlines and we take on those banners and we rush out to become, we need to understand what it is all about. We need to delve deep. We need to start from the basics, from the root, right? Because if we're going to transform our lives, it needs to come from a very basic understanding of what this is all about. And for me, um, I think where we need to start is by understanding what our authentic selves in fact are. Now, for you to um, become authentic, it means already what that you already um, you've already experienced the inauthentic, the fake, the unoriginal. For anything to be original, there must be a fake, right? So it means that if we want to embrace our authentic selves, we must understand why the lives that we're living now are not authentic and define what exactly our authentic self is and where it comes from. Because if you don't understand the root of it, you will not really be able to manifest the fruit of it. That was pretty good, right? If you don't understand the root, you won't be able to manifest the fruit. And think about the byline of this of this um, series. We say it is exploring the deep truths and the principles that will enable you to become all you were created to be. But how do we do that? How do we experience that reality? First of all, we need, to, we need to ask ourselves the question, where does our authentic self come from? And in order to do that, we need to look at that, that um, sentence or that byline, all we were created to be, meaning that we're not just, we're not just a random experiment. We're not just uh, something that descended from outer space. We didn't come here on an asteroid, right? We were created. But, you know, once you say that, of course, you get into trouble with the, uh, the evolutionists, right? Because you have to understand that there are two major theories of how the world and everything in it came to be. So we have the theory of evolution, right? And all of us basically know that, right? If you went to school um, and you went through the science class, you would have heard about the theory of evolution, which essentially says that uh, the universe and everything in the universe came about through um, a big explosion. It's called the Big Bang, the Big Bang, right? And from that point, 
um, everything in the universe sort of evolved, right? And life evolved through a series of um, happenstances and occurrences and, you know, things coming together, you know, randomly or perhaps not. Um, and then life beginning to mutate, right? So from things like um, organic matter, like amoebas, um, life started to mutate into things like tadpoles and frogs. And then it became um, uh, uh, salamanders and then apes. And then, you know, from that humans evolved, which is fine because you have to respect science. You have to respect uh, the theories of science. We're able to understand quite a, a number of things about how the world works um, and how things really in, in the universe work. But, but the problem with the theory of evolution it, is that it does not answer a number of questions. So take, for instance, the differentiation between human beings and animals, right? If we were or if, or if we evolved from animals, why is it that the way we think or the way we process information or the things that we have been able to do as a human species seem to be so far removed from what animals are able to do, right? The way humans think, the way we do things, the, the way we're able to command territories or the way we're able to explore or the way we're able to go out and do stuff is of a much higher level than the way animals would do, including apes. Now, I don't know about you, but I ain't no ape, and I ain't no tackle either, right? So uh, if you want to subscribe to the theory of evolution, well, um, you might have some problems, you know, trying to relate all that together, okay? Because essentially what, what, what um, the Big Bang is suggesting is that you are basically a sophisticated amoeba. Now that is really, really um, kind of awkward when you think about it, a sophisticated amoeba, I mean, come on, really, right? But what is the other theory? It is the theory of creation, the theory of creation. And this theory postulates that life is not random. It didn't just happen. There was no, there wasn't necessarily a big bang, but life, the universe, and all of us, everything in the universe was deliberately created. Not by anything in particular, but by a supreme being who set about organizing and designing and envisioning this place, this earth, this universe and everything in it for a particular purpose. That supreme being is, of course, God. Now, there are very many religions out there uh, who, who put God at the forefront, whatever the idea of God is, right? Now, we're not here to debate that or we're not here to argue about that. But essentially, that is what the theory of creation is talking about that God himself, the supreme being, created this world and everything in it, including us, including us as human beings. Now, if you subscribe to that theory, like I do, and quite a number of people do as well, then this whole thing about becoming starts to make sense. Why? Because you as a human being are essentially a product now, what do, I mean, what do I mean by that? Uh, let's talk a little bit about the theory of manufacturing. Now, we know what manufacturers do, right? They create products or they manufacture products or they make products to purpose. And of course, manufacturing is widespread. So you can have the manufacturer of a phone, for instance, um, the manufacturer of a car, the manufacturer of electronic equipment, the manufacturer of X, Y, Z things. All of these people, all of these companies are manufacturers. And what they have done or what they do essentially is to um, design products to achieve something specific, right? A phone was manufactured to achieve something specific. A car was manufactured to achieve something specific. Electronic equipment, the laptop that I'm using, um, the, the, the furniture in your house, 
right? All of these things were manufactured or were created or were designed to achieve something specific. In other words, there was a purpose behind the creation or the manufacture of these things that we're talking about. Now, if you look at the Bible, which essentially, um, for those of us who believe in it, is essentially a program of events, some of them historical, but mostly symbolic, that talks about how, essentially in the beginning, how the world was created. It comes to a particular portion, and it says that God created man. After he had done a certain number of things, he had created um, the atmosphere, right? First of all, he had called light to, to manifest in darkness. He had created the animals. He had created the vegetation. And then eventually he created man. But if you study everything that was created prior to man, and then you study what was said about man at creation, you discover that there was a very, or there's a very huge difference. So prior to that, he said, let the earth bring forth vegetation, for instance, let the earth bring forth the animals, let the seas bring forth the fish or the living creatures in the fish, you know, let birds fly in the air, you know, let the earth bring this, let the skies bring this, let the water bring this. But, but, when he created man, the story changed. It was no longer let the earth, let the water, let the sky. He said, let us create man, not just create man, but create man in our own image and in our likeness, in our image and in our likeness. And I could stop there and teach on this for like the next one hour and it will just go on and on, right? But we're not really here to talk about that right now, but we're gonna talk about it sometime later, but that is not the real thrust of this conversation. I, I want to take you somewhere, right? So just, uh, just stay with me. Said, let us create man in our own image and in our likeness. And now this is the reason, let them have dominion, dominion over the birds of the air the fish of the sea, and everything that creeps upon the ground. In other words, let him have dominion over everything else that I have created. In other words, the purpose for the creation of man was to have dominion over the resources of the earth and over the earth itself, which explains why man has such superior intelligence, why man has been able to explore things so deeply, why he has been able to go to the limits of, or he has gone to outer space, he has gone to inner space, he has been able to think up things and inventions and great and wonderful products because he was created in the image of God and was given certain abilities and he has certain things within him that when he releases is able to do something very, very wonderful, right? Now, if you take the story up from that, it now becomes a whole lot more interesting. And I said, what we're here to talk about our authenticity, embracing our authenticity, which is the key to resolving all those things that we talked about. Now, how do we do that? How do we embrace our authenticity what is the key to unlocking our authenticity because remember that i said that for for us to understand the authentic it means we must first understand the inauthentic for you to appreciate the original you must first understand the fake and if we want to be authentic we must first of all appreciate that the lives that we're living now are not truly our authentic lives. And how do we know this? Because we have those needs, those eight needs. Those needs are bugging us. They have bugged us right from childhood in different, uh, in different influences or in different ways. We have not really recognized them all 
the time. Maybe conscious, um, subconsciously we do, but consciously we may not have. But those needs have been there all along. And it has been telling us something, right? It's, it's, like, it's like symptoms. You know, when you're ill, if you have an illness, you would start to develop what we call symptoms. So for instance, if you have uh, malaria, for instance, you would have what? High temperature, loss of appetite. Those things are all symptoms that are pointing to a fact that, hey, buddy, there's something wrong with your buddy. That kind of rhyme, buddy, buddy, get it? <laughs> right? So those needs, the manifestation of those needs are telling you that there is something wrong with the life that you're living. And if you don't fix that, these symptoms will continue to manifest and will just continue to evolve. And then life, as you know, it gets worse and worse and worse. But for those of us who have understood that our lives are meant to be are meant to be lived authentically and we have embraced our authenticity, life becomes so much more interesting. And that really is the difference um, that we ascribe to those people who have quote unquote made it, not just made it in terms of um, achieving financial success, but who have risen to um, the pinnacle, right? The people that we see have had influence in the world, the world changers, the game changers, the people of impact, the Martin Luther Kings, the Malcolm X's, the Muhammad Ali's, the Mo Mother Theresa's, the JFK's, those are people of impact that the world will not forget because they embraced their authenticity. Now, what is the key? I'm asking again, what is the key to authenticity? How do we break into the authentic life? Well, I'm here to talk about it. And I think, and I know, and I believe that it boils down to one word. It's a word you're familiar with, but you'll be surprised and probably shocked to learn that this word doesn't really mean what you think or what you have thought all this time that it meant. Are you ready for the word? Okay, here we go. Work. Work. For you to release your authentic self, you must work. You must work. And that's just it. Now, you're probably screaming and you're probably rolling your eyes and you're probably like, what is William going on about? But that's the simple truth. You must work. But I said that work doesn't really mean what you think it means or what you have thought it meant all this time. It's really something quite different. And for you to understand and appreciate that truth or, the, or, or this reality, you have to go all the way back to the beginning. Back to the beginning. Back to the beginning. Where's the beginning? The creation of man. Now, we talked a little bit about that. And, and I said that um, God has stated his purpose for creating man, which was to have dominion, right? But let's move forward a little bit. Now, in the first chapter of Genesis, which essentially is a summary of how the world was created, right? We read about the summary, but in chapter two, we look at the details. That's the difference because you see that um, if, if, you, if you study those two chapters, there appear to be contradictions. Now, the difference is that chapter one is a summary, is what God did, but chapter two is the details. It's how he did it, right? So you, so you look at chapter two and you see that God formed the man from the dust of the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And what? Man became a living soul. Now, that is very interesting. I think we need to spend a little bit uh, of time here. Now, think about it. Think about it. There was nobody else around, or no other human person anyway. And the creator had formed, had taken time to form this body from the dust of the ground. He carefully formed it. He formed the head and the shoulders and the legs and the torso and everything. And it was there, it was still, it was lifeless. 
There was no heartbeat. There was no breathing in about uh, in and out. There was nothing. There was just a stillness. It was perfectly still, perfectly dead, <laughs> perfectly empty, perfectly devoid of life. It was just a casing. And the Bible says that God breathed into the man's nostrils, the breath of life. Now think about that. Now, when you when you breathe into a person's nostrils, I, I just want you to imagine that picture in your head. Breathe into his nostrils. It means that what? For you to breathe into another person's nostrils, you have to be really close. almost like this, almost as though you're kissing the person, right? And you breathe into the nostrils. Think about it. Just imagine it. God breathed into his nostrils. It meant that the face of God was touching the face of man. And he breathed the essence into his nostrils. And man, what? became a living soul now the word soul there meant that or, or the word or, or the phrase living soul meant that he was aware of his environment he was aware of everything that made him who he was as a man he was aware of the trees and the plants and the animals he was aware he had the consciousness right but what did god breathe into him he breathed into him his spirit Remember that God said, let us make man, right? So what he breathed into that casing that he had made, remember that he formed the body, but he breathed into him the spirit. And that's the difference. The body, your body, this, this is not really you. This is not you. What you see, when you look in the mirror, you know, the eyes and the nose and the hands and the, you know, the chin and the mouth and all that. That's not really you. That is just your casing. That is just your earth suit. Now, if you look at the word human, it's actually uh, a combination of two, two words, humus and man. Humus and man. What do those two words mean? Humus actually means soil or earth or dust. Man, the Hebrew word for man uh, in the Bible, or, uh, as written in the Bible, is the word called ish. And ish is a spirit. It means spirit. And ish is not gender-based, right? It is not gender-based. So uh, a female has the spirit that is called man. The male has the spirit that is called man. Both of both of them have the spirit that is called man. So the man or man-ish is the spirit. That spirit was what was breathed into the humus casing. And that is why man became a living soul, a human being, human. That is why we're all human, whether we're male or female. We're human because we have man, the spirit within us, whatever our earth casing may be, whether it's a male earth casing or a female earth casing. But here's the thing. The spirit that was breathed into the human body contained everything that that human was supposed to become. Now, listen to what uh, God said to the man. The very first place that God put him in was the place called Eden. And Eden wasn't necessarily um, a physical place. It was actually an atmosphere, which is why a lot of people are finding it difficult to locate where, <laughs> where Eden was supposed to have existed because it wasn't really a place. It was an atmosphere. But what was the very first commandment that God spoke to the man. He said that he should work 
It should work the ground. Now, when you see work the ground, the first picture that jumps into your head is, you know, maybe like a gardener, maybe he had a spade or something, or was using his bare hands to sort of like uh, work the ground. But that's not really what he meant. If you study the word work, the word in Greek is a word called eragon, eragon, E-R-E-G-O-N, eragon. And what does it mean? You'd be very surprised. <laughs> You'd be very surprised. But you'd probably be a little excited. Now, here's what the word means. Eragon. It means to fulfill. It means to reveal. It means to manifest. It simply means to become. Are you excited? Work means to become yourself. And that was, that's exactly what God was saying. When he said, Adam, work. He said that the man should become everything that was within him. It's also interesting to note that the word Adam wasn't really referring to a single person. In fact, Adam or Adam actually means mankind. It actually means mankind. And it's interesting to note that God only made or only formed one human from the dust of the ground, the body from the dust of the ground, and he never went back. Because everything that that body was supposed to do was already in the body, which is really the principle of creation. The seed of everything is in itself, which is why when you plant uh, the seed of, of any fruit tree, it what it eventually grows into a tree itself because the seed of everything is in itself the seed of mankind was already in the first man so all he had to do was to meet the first two men and they would get together and things would happen <laughs> and and you know almost 6000 or 7000 years later adam is still working because here we are here we all are, well, almost 8 billion people on the planet, but it all came from one single human being. One single human being. Now, Adam, like I said, referred to mankind. So it meant that whatever God had said to the man at that point wasn't referring to, he wasn't really referring to only that man. He was referring to everything and everyone that was in that man. So the command of work refers to us as well. Now, how do we work? How do we become? Now, think, think about it this way. If you held a seed in your hand and you said to the seed, work, what you're asking the seed to do is to become what it was created to, to be, which is what? A tree or a forest. If you held a bird in your hand and you say work, you're asking it to become what it was supposed or what was created to be, which was to fly. If you had a fish in your hand and you said work, you are asking it to do what it was supposed to do, which is to swim. In other words, to work means to become what you were created to be. I hope you had a good time with me this evening. And uh, I really had a good time explaining to you what all that meant. And I'm looking forward to even going deeper in subsequent editions. But for now, have a great evening, a great night, a great morning, a great afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Take care of yourself and be safe. Peace.